This is the Demystifying Mental Toughness Podcast, hosted by David Charlton, and you're listening to this podcast to help you build your own mental toughness, or so that you can support other people or your clients better. Either way, you will learn more about developing this plastic personality trait that all but guarantees that you will perform better and lead a more prosperous life. Today's guest is brilliant and very engaging. If you're a football coach, a player, a parent of a young player, or simply a fan of football, you're going to enjoy this. I speak to Edu Rubio, who has coached at Valencia and Chelsea and now works as a technical consultant at Crystal Palace, and the content is gold. The conversation flowed as we chatted about the challenges young academy footballers have and how to best support them. We unpick Edu's interest in motivational interviewing and how this has helped his coaching. We also go on to discuss the role of the coach and parent in having a positive impact on young footballers. From your experiences of working in academy football, what are the typical challenges that young players come across and how do you best support them? So um, there are lots of different kind of challenges and obviously we could divide them into different type of areas. So there is the, cha- the social challenges. Of course, um, in, in a social corner, they do obviously become quite popular in a school because they do play in academies, um, which it might be quite good at times because obviously they get the attention, but obviously that, that also affects their behaviours. And, and it might obviously get them into a bubble that then when they get released, if they do get released, then that bubble burst. And then obviously you have to pick up the consequences. And so that could be an interesting challenge. Then obviously there is also the peer pressure in academy, um, the, com- the constant comparison with all the players, the constant uh, competition within the team, the constant competition within yourself which again you know in a healthy positive way it could be actually really good to build as you know better than myself to build resilience and self um, motivation self-belief and and to actually gain confidence in your ability as a human being but it can also go the other way so that could be also a challenge then there are challenges within the understanding of the game and then how the coaches cope with that and how they get supported with that. There are challenges in terms of parents' support and in terms of uh, support mechanism around the players. So without trying to portray the negative image, because obviously um, some people might perceive a challenge as a problem, my mindset is that a challenge is a lovely opportunity for growth. So, so when we say challenge for me is actually a really positive word and, is a, and, it, and it carries a lovely energy for you to kind of like grow as a person, as an individual, as an athlete. Um, but it could also, it could be, it could be quite daunting at times. Um, and that's why I've always believed that elite football by nature is not really healthy. Um, however, we can make it healthier and we can make it more natural depending on how we work with it and how we create the environment for the players to be able to cope with it in a different manner. When you say there about it not necessarily being a healthy environment, how, do you want to just elaborate on that? Yeah, I mean, when I say not healthy as such, I mean, for example, take the example I've given you about the challenges. Um, constant comparison with others um, for me is all about your personal growth is all about how good I can become myself is all about where I can be better than I was yesterday but the minute I get compared with the person next to me and especially when I'm growing up as, a, as an individual and I don't even know who I am yet um, sometimes we get to 30 years old and we don't even know who we are yet so yet alone when you are only 12, 11, 13, 14, 17, 18, 20. And so that constant comparison with others could really be unhealthy. 
and not just unhealthy in your own mind about who you are and about not building the needed self-belief and, and, and self-confidence to create that healthy environment, but also from a social perspective is not good because then you are seeing others as competition rather than seeing others as people who can support your growth. And at times that growth and that support will be by competing, but not necessarily competing as understanding competition about beating the other person. Um, so that's what I mean by at times not being healthy. And also it's not, and that's obviously what we need to try to do in academy football and what we need to try to do in our environments. But at times it's not really a normal life if you were not into football and if you were not in an elite, you are missing out loads of things uh, like, you know, uh, competitions in your uh, in your school, having an opportunity to go and to certain birthday parties. You're missing out certain things, which, of course, they might not be seen as a sacrifice. They might be seen just as an effort that you need to undertake to be able to do what you love, which is play academy football. But still, at times, might get in the way for you to build relationships with others and for you to have, you know, a certain, a certain degree of normality in your life. Yeah, I can see what you're talking about, where you mentioned there about the comparison side of things. And I suppose as a coach, you'll have to you'll have to watch your language and what what you're saying there. Um, but it's very much, I suppose, like when when kids are going to school, teachers will have to be careful not to compare and contrast with with, with other children, um, because ultimately it could go and shape a youngster's self esteem how they feel about themselves to how they then communicate with, with other people. They might, you might find that they withdraw because they're, they're comparing themselves too much to, to some of their teammates. Absolutely. Um, so, so yeah, the, I suppose the key skill, like I say there for a coach is, is really managing how they communicate and being aware of how you communicate. Um, absolutely. Look, um, obviously part of my job is to coach the coaches as well. Um, and I do believe that a, a coach has to be in certain in certain degree has to be a leader. When I say a leader, obviously that this could be another podcast, by the way. <laughs> but obviously, I don't see leadership as as authority or title or being the boss. I see leadership as an opportunity to uh, inspire others and, and an opportunity to provide growth to others and to yourself. And so, for me, that type of leadership needed as a coach or as a teacher, should be a leadership as a servant leader, should be someone who's very clear in their communication, very clear in their support, in their help, and very clear in strategies that are going to help that person taking into account that person's needs. Um, so, yeah, I agree 100% with what you said there. And one of the other things I, I really liked about what you talked about you mentioned the word learning quite a few times and growth there. And if you're, I mean, this is a, this is a skill we can all master. I think we, we all fall into the trap of is when you see someone who's doing maybe better than you, whether it's myself as a sports psychologist, yourself as a coach or as a player, it's very, very easy to get a little bit envious and jealous to a point. Sure. Um, but the, yeah, the skill is certainly actually looking at what they do and then taking the learning from that and applying it yourself. And, and, and eventually also um, embrace that emotion. I mean, that emotion and that feeling of envy or, you know, is I don't see it as a negative or a positive emotion or feeling. Any emotion or feeling could actually be healthy or unhealthy depending on how you manage it. So it's more the reaction uh, that you trigger from that emotion. So if that few seconds of envy are going to then be processed in your mind when you've embraced it and understood that that envy shouldn't get in the way of building a healthy relationship with that person and shouldn't um, destroy your self-confidence and your self-belief and your confidence, but should only fuel that excitement of learning and growing then it's actually a really positive emotion. But it wasn't positive or negative by itself. It was your reaction 
So I always tell my players that there is no bad or, or good emotions or feelings. It's just how you react from it. And it's always building that mindset of understanding that anything out there is an opportunity to challenge yourself. And any challenge is an opportunity to learn and grow. And learn and growth is the most important vehicle to, to actually get successful in anything you want to do in life. Yeah, I like that because we're taught, aren't we, that if you, if you experience a, a negative emotion, be it jealousy, envy, or, or whatever it is, it's a lot of people are, to, are, are told, you know, you, want, you don't want to experience too much of that, you know, and they try and push it away, just just ignore yeah. it. But, but actually, it's, it's just a part of life, isn't it? <laughs> we're, Absol- we're, absolutely. Yeah. Sorry, I was just going to say the brain is built to, in that way, where you experience more negative and critical thoughts than you do uh, positive and happy ones. Absolutely. And, and it's kind of like, obviously, you know, as a sports psychologist, it's actually kind of like going against nature and, 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 and trying to dehumanize, if you like, the, the, the person. Because it's like, we all have those uh, emotions at times. Uh, it's part of nature. It's part of being a human being. Um, and actually, not having them uh, would be kind of wrong because they are there for a reason. Um, but it's, it's just how you react to them. And it's how you build your mindset to filter and embrace those emotions in one way or another. Yeah, most definitely. I like to use a it's called like three R's approach, where you, you know you recognize that emotion, then you regroup and you refocus. So I suppose a lot of my work would be helping the the athlete come, or the footballer come up with a little strategies to be able to refocus. And I can imagine, like likewise, you'll you'll have similar conversations in your coaching. Absolutely. Yeah, I like that. To be fair, I like the idea of the three R's. And yeah, that's that's what we try to do as well. Um, because again, I mean, we all, we all need to acknowledge that we are human beings. And, and so, you know, there is this kind of like belief at times that athletes and elite athletes and successful people, you know, have to have, you know, certain traits that others don't have or vice versa. And it's like, no, no, hold on a minute. They're just, you know, <laughs> normal people with a clear mindset and a clear approach. Um, and that's what we, so it's possible. It is possible for anyone to be successful in something in their life because everyone has got a gift to offer. Um, so it's just how you enhance that gift and what mindset and perceptions you build around it um, to obviously contribute to it. Yeah, yeah, very much so. And I would imagine on, on the pitch, no, no two games are, are the same, are they? No two teams are the same. You've got to make quick snap decisions and then respond very, very quickly and clearly. So, you know, building what independent learners has is, is got to be a huge part of what you, you do as well in the academy. Absolutely. Uh, look, there is, and I'm glad that you've asked this and you've just brought this subject here because I might be wrong, uh, but there is this kind of like um, debate in football at times that when you offer autonomy and when you um, question your players to be able for them to make their own decisions and to question themselves, is like that's development, therefore that's academy. That cannot happen in a lead. That cannot happen with the first team. I mean, there is kind of like, and, and I might be a little bit bonkers here, but I think we are dealing with human beings. It doesn't matter whether we are academy, whether we are first team, it doesn't matter. I mean, we all need autonomy. We all need, of course, in first team, as it is a three-point um, game every Saturday or every Monday, whenever the game is played. Of course, you may have to make more executive decisions at times and, 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 a bit, and, and, and to be a bit sharper. But there is still development to be done and there is still loads of growth uh, within those players. So oh, promoting autonomy, promoting um, decision-making from the athlete, I think is fundamental because the minute they understand the process, they understand why we're doing things, then you can coach them better. I mean, the person who knows the athlete the best is either himself or herself. And so the minute they know how to listen to themselves and the minute they're in charge of their own learning, 
And when we say being in charge of their own learning, doesn't mean the coach is not going to be there doing that job. Doesn't mean that the coach is not going to coach. What it means is the coach is going to coach that person with a wider opportunity in terms of resources because that athlete can feed back more information to the coach because they know themselves better, because they know what they need to do better. And therefore, there is more opportunity for both of them to create a much more accurate and appropriate um, coaching, individual coaching for that person. Um, but it's just that it's, it's, I believe that at times in football, especially, I don't want to talk about all the disciplines because I don't know that much. Um, but in football, at times we miss the streak. Um, I think we, we go very much like black and white. Uh, in first team, we need to do this. In academy, we can, we do that. Um, promoting autonomy and, 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 and self, um, learning is, is something that it's kind of like, too much around the coach not coaching. And it's like, well, hold on a minute. I mean, you know, why do we have to go when actually I believe that life is full of grace and, and, and coaching is more a gray subject than white or black. Yeah, no, I, I agree. Because regardless of whether you're 16, 23, 28, or, well, that was 38, but you could be 58, 68 for that matter, you you don't know yourself fully. You, you have blind spots. So being questioned by another person, be it a coach, be it a support, the support member, family member, it, it can only be helpful. Which, Absolutely. And it, then it leads us on quite nicely to the, the next question, actually, because in order, when you're questioning people, you find out more about their motivation, don't you, and, and why they sure. do it. So on that topic, I'm aware that you've got an interest in motivational interviewing. And I just wondered how you integrate that into your coaching. Yeah. So basically that came about a few years ago when I had the opportunity to meet um, Stephen Rolnick, who is obviously the co-founder of motivational interviewing. And I like to believe that, you know, that we are good friends now. <laughs> so it's not like um, I'm dropping name there. Uh, I'm sure that Stephen will be very happy when he, he listens to this and yeah i mean jokes aside we, we we speak almost every week and and so obviously he he kind of like taught me the the method and um, which obviously is out there for people to look in you know into it um but basically what it is is um and a strategy to offer the athletes the staff the people you work with an opportunity to say what they feel and they think at any given time. And so straight away, you are promoting a much healthier environment because everything is in the open. Um, and then obviously it's through motivational interviewing that you monitor what happens in the environment and you make sure that the environment remains one in which everyone, absolutely everyone, feels free to say what they think and they feel at any given time. And what we do at times is we um, organize Indavas. Indava is a really fancy name that um, Stephen came up with, and I, I really like it. It comes obviously, it comes from Africa. It comes from uh, the Zulus, a tribe in Africa, where what they do basically is when they have a problem or when they have something, it doesn't need to be a problem, when they have something to clarify, to solve, to decide as a tribe, they just sit around, lovely circle, like if it was a circle of trust. And then obviously they take it in turns to speak and to listen to each other. And there is a lot of um, exquisite listening, which I believe is something that at times we miss in elite environments. We do a lot of talking, we do a lot of uh, observing things um, in terms of the game, but we don't listen to each other a lot. Um, and so that's what the Indaba is about. And yes, and that's basically what I incorporated a few years ago in my coaching. And now when I do do go to other coaching environments, I try to bring with me because I think it's very useful, uh, mainly for that reason, mainly to create an environment in where there is no hierarchy. What there is, is we are all in here together and we all need to listen to each other to make sure that we meet everyone's needs. And we'll do that 
by allowing everyone to express their feelings, their emotions, their thoughts without reservations and without um, feeling judged. And I think that's very powerful. It's music to my ears, that is. It's uh, certainly creating a, a really healthy environment because ob- obviously in football, it's a, it's a heavily heavily social environment, isn't it, where you've got obviously players, support staff, coaches, and they, they could be, a, um, certainly to the, the person who's maybe not the most confident, they could look at hierarchies and egos and, and sure. yeah, get caught up in mind reading and just assuming various different things. So I can see how that can be really, really helpful for yeah, for everybody involved. Because um, I, I mean, if you think about it, some players can can often be frightened to, to actually speak to the coach, to the manager. So that that's going to be, be so helpful for them. And, and, and it's funny because... Um... When either you go to a new environment or when a, a new player comes into your environment, that happens a lot. Where obviously, you know, we've been, I like to say at times, like we've been socialized in a way that, you know, it's best not to express our feelings when we think that those feelings are going to, you know, upset someone and therefore we are going to pay the consequence uh, with their behaviors, their actions or their decisions. And, and that's what happens a lot. Um, in our environment and and it's but for me even though at times I've been criticized uh, by having this school of school of thought and like if oh this is weak I mean you have to be there making decisions you are the boss you are the for me it's actually it shows more strength I think a leader who is prepared to listen a leader who is prepared to make decisions based on everyone's opinions um, of course as I said, that person will have to make certain decisions. And, and, and it's not about not making the decisions. It's not about being afraid of making decisions. It's about including everyone in the decision-making process because then the outcomes will probably be healthier, will probably be more supported by people, and they will probably see the greater picture because I've always believed that, you know, 10, 20, 30 sets of eyes see more than just one. And so um, that's kind of like what we are trying to promote at times, trying to kind of like change that belief pattern and change that mindset in which people have perceived uh, exquisite listening, um, healthy environments, um, contributing to everyone's uh, ideas and listening to everyone as weak. When for me, and this is my personal view, is more like, if anything, is it shows a strength. Yeah, yeah, most definitely. Because if if you're going to get listened to, and then the those things are acted upon, you you feel valued automatically. So it has such a high correlation with with somebody's motivation there. This is a short advertisement introducing the sponsor for the show, Chimera Sport, who produce a range of sportswear and equipment to help enhance performance and recovery, reducing injury occurrences. And as someone who has had long-standing back issues, I've personally tested some of the garments and I've been more than happy with them. You'll also find that the infrared sportswear has been clinically tested too, so it's great for fitness enthusiasts who want to push harder, go further and recover quicker. More details can be found on the product section of our website and in the show notes. And, and to be fair, you you are spot on with that comment that you've just made, acting upon. I mean, it's not just, and, and that's a very good point, because when we do the endeavors or when, you know, when we use um, motivational interviewing with our meetings with the players and so on, it's not just about listening. It's not just about, obviously, making sure that everyone has an opportunity to express their views and their feelings and, and their thoughts. It's then acting upon them is then being resourceful and being you know being being assertive to to say okay now we've got this bank of knowledge now we do have this now let's make decisions so it, it's not about you know that kind of like softy softy idea of i'll listen to you and then you know i'll pat you on the back and then we move on it's more about okay let me what you you know let me let me know your thoughts Let's see what we can do. I'll tell you my thoughts. We'll compromise. We'll come to an agreement and then we'll act on it. And then we'll be assertive 
to make sure that we are on track. Um, so if anything, it, it, it reinforces the individual development plan of any player. Yeah, and then that's how you're going to create buy-in ultimately. Otherwise, if you don't act on it and fulfill promises, then as far as the player's concerned, it's you're, you're just going to be seen as someone who blows hot air, I suppose. And, and Exactly. Yeah, then the whole the whole system breaks down, doesn't it? Where people just then don't express their feelings and thoughts because they know it's going to be a waste a waste of time. Absolutely, absolutely. So, so yeah, you are spot on. Is is also, you know, to reinforce the process and to reinforce uh, the idea, um, actions have to be taken and and decisions have to be made. And so, it's not um, the idea of using motivational interviewing is not around not making decisions it's not around not being assertive as a leader it's more about how you make those decisions or how you come to those decisions and the way you do so is by making sure that you've included everyone in the decision making process yeah i think i think we're we're like sort of touching on collective leadership there and where you've got the the group collective goal and like like as you say everybody's everybody's account is taken into perspective and then yeah you, you drive ahead and go and go for the goal rather than egos uh, coming into it exactly anyway um we're approaching the the end <laughs> towards the end of the interview there now um how would you say support mechanisms be that parents family members um player liaison officers agents how can they best support Young young children in football, so they they're a positive role model. That's a great question. So, again, um, I think we we all need to be educated. I mean, we all need. I mean, first of all, the main actor, the main person, is the player. Is him or her? I mean, so I think the best way to to support the athlete is to acknowledge that it's their journey. It's not mine. It's not mommy's or daddy's. It's not whoever. It's, it's their journey. That is the first, I think that's the first step. And then once we acknowledge that, then probably those people who are surrounding the athlete understand then how to talk to the athlete. Um, because they probably, the support they offer will be more based on covering their needs and helping them the way they they want to be helped rather than imposing or rather than dictating their views into their journey. So I think number one thing is, it's their journey, it's not yours. Then once you've come, once the parents, the, 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 the best friends, the agent, the player liaison, whoever is in that support mechanism for each individual, then once they've acknowledged that, that it's their journey, not their, not yours, then it's about questioning. It's about understanding that person. Actually, fun enough, it's about a, a little bit of motivational interviewing. It's about what happens with this person. How do you need uh, me in what way, um, in what quantity? And and then being supportive and, being, and, and not, being, not being there like a deficit inspector. And I like this term because sometimes when you are in the background and you are not the person who is walking that journey, it's very easy to see what they're missing, what they should be doing. But that's a lot of judgment. And also that's a lot of like from your views and your perspective, but not the one who is walking the way. And so it's funny that if we detach ourselves from that, and I'm talking now from those people who are surrounding the athlete, and we stop being that deficit inspector who is constantly there seeing what that person is missing, and what we become is more an energizer, is more someone who is there to offer unconditional support, is there to detach their ego from the journey and just say, listen, I'm here for you. What do you need? And you and you talk with openness and you talk with honesty and with a certain degree of maturity in, in the conversation, then I think that's the best way an athlete can be supported um, because then they will grow as well. 
Um, because when you become a deficit inspector, you also want to stop them from having, say, a certain degree of failure. And you also want to stop them from walking the journey the way it needs to be walked. Um, and the minute you, you become more like an energizer, you are kind of like allowing that person, allowing that athlete to, to go through the roller coaster of being an athlete to go through the ups and downs, to feel those emotions, to feel those feelings, to embrace them and to grow. Because if we don't do that, we'll come to a point where the failure is going to be inevitable or it's going to be so great. And when I say the failure, I don't mean not winning games, not being part of the squad. For me, failure is more not knowing yourself. Not, 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 not having the opportunity to self-discover who you are as a person. That, that to me is the failure, really. And, and the minute the, the people who are surrounding that player do things and behave in certain ways and, and do say certain things that stop that person, that athlete, to walk their way, the, the, the way it needs to be walked, they're not supporting their growth and they are stopping that person from learning their lessons. And, and I believe in a way, and it might sound harsh, they're actually contributing to their failure as, as human beings. Yeah, I tend to agree. You, you touched on words like protect. And yeah, if you're going to protect someone, then you're not going to help them build the, the relevant levels of resilience in order to, to get through I was going to say football, but life in general as well. Because as, as we said at the start of the the episode, life and football is fraught with setbacks and obstacles, challenges, and certainly from the on the psychological side, I know there's a model, a resilience model out there, which basically says, you know, if you've got high support and it's high challenge, then that that is that's the optimum way there to, to help someone sure. learn. Uh, so yeah, that's pretty much what you've mentioned there, which is yeah, which is great for for the listeners there. So be it yeah, if you're a coach, a, a family friend, a, a parent, you're going to get something from this, no doubt about it. And who would you say has been the the biggest influence on your career to date? It's it's funny because. I'm very blessed. I've had loads of really, really talented managers and, and coaches helping me out. Um, and obviously, I've been blessed with my family as well, my parents. Um, they've been always very, very supportive. And, but, and, and my sister as well. But I would say that, and I don't want to say this, um, when I say this, I, I don't want this to sound like egotistic at all. Because I'm, if anything, I'm probably the opposite. But I think it's been me. As in, and when I say this, I mean, I'm with myself 24-7. And, and it's only you. And that's my belief as well. And that's what I say to the athletes I work with. I have, again, I've been blessed with mentors and, and, and people and family and friends who are there for me. And without them, I wouldn't be where I am. And I know it sounds cliche, but it is true. But ultimately, I think it has to be your biggest supporter and your biggest um, idol and the pe- has to be your true self. It has to be you detaching from your ego right? and kind of like being the one who is like there. It's like, who, who am I? Who am I really? Why am I here for? What do I do? What do I want? Um, you know, and really go deep into yourself and really kind of like, Make sure that everyone else is there to tap into knowledge, into resources, into learning, into growth, um, into support. But ultimately, when you go back into wherever you go, you are by yourself, even if you are surrounded by everyone else. And I think when you are capable of saying, you know what, it's me, it's, 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 it's only me, then, then you've got a bigger a big opportunity to be happier in your mind. And I think, as I said earlier in, in, this, in this podcast, I generally believe that for me, success 
to spin it in a much more positive way because I think earlier I said like failure. Um, success is about being content and happy within yourself and, and, and understanding that you are your biggest idol and your biggest, and I don't say, and obviously, again, I have to be careful when I say these things because it, it could be understood as kind of like egotistic or kind of like um, uh, self-absorbed or self-centered or anything like that. But uh, no, I mean, it's it's more kind of like saying detach yourself from your ego and find your true self and your true soul. Actually, make sure that you are there for you because otherwise you cannot really embrace everyone else's support. Everyone else's support and help won't be optimized in the same degree as if when you are kind of like satisfied with yourself and when you respect yourself. And I think that's a massive thing for any athletes to respect and love your, th themselves because they mainly they do respect and love themselves. Wow, it's powerful. The empowerment they get and the resources they get and the resilience and the degree of, of um, self-confidence um, and assertiveness that they get, it's, you know, it's something really, really magical. I don't know how to follow that. That was brilliant. <laughs> I certainly couldn't have explained it as well as that. Uh, no, I love that. Uh, that, that is, yeah, it's fantastic. Because yeah. like we said before there, in effect, you drive your own bus or your own car. You're the one who has to take the necessary action, make the decisions on the spot. So, yeah, no, that, that feeds nicely into that. I love it. Well, yeah, well done. Thank you. <laughs> no, thank you. Thank you so much for the opportunity, obviously, given to speak to you and, and to, to, to get involved in, the, in this podcast. I do listen to your podcast. I love it. So I'm, I was really excited to obviously get invited and, and have an opportunity to have a chat with you. Yeah, well, likewise, I, I, was, I was really looking forward to, to this chat as well. And I, I, I knew from the, the brief conversation we had earlier, a few weeks ago, that you would have some great uh, takeaways for the for the listeners so to, to finish the episode what are the three key takeaways for the listeners i would say the three key factors or the three key takeaways would be one would be see everything as an opportunity to grow i would say learning is the key factor to succeed in whatever uh, you want to succeed and whatever success means to you and respect and love yourself um, because that is so important. I mean, you are within yourself 24 seven. Um, you know, no one else is going to care for you as much as you do. No one else is going to be with you 24 seven. No one else is going to do it for you and no one else should or could. And so you walk your way, make sure that you, you know, while you walk it, you are content with yourself. Brilliant, that is. Where, whereabouts can the listeners uh, find you? Should they reach out to you and want to ask any questions or, or get in touch? Thank you. Um, obviously, aside from my day-to-day -day job in coaching at Crystal Palace right now, I do have a uh, project called My Energy Game. And so they can, they can subscribe at the uh, website completely for free. And then they can reach out. They can obviously drop me an email there and we can definitely talk. And obviously in my um, coach Ed Rubio handle uh, Twitter, I'm also more than happy to obviously get any DMs and, 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 and reach out to people. Brilliant. Okay, well, yeah, thank you. Um, and in the show notes, I'll put the, the relevant information in there. If, you know, if people do want to get in touch, then they, they know where to get you. So excellent. Um, really appreciate your time. No, thank you so much, David. I'm, I, I love it. Obviously, if you, I mean, if now the things are starting to open up, if you want to come down and, you know, and, and have a look at how we do things and meet up, I know it's a long way and I know it's obviously difficult, but I'll be, I'll be more than happy to meet up. That would be really lovely. I might take you up on that one um, in the not too distant future. <laughs> yeah. I really could have chatted to Edu for days and hours and weeks for that matter. I just loved that conversation and the way it was going. It was such a shame to have to cut it off. It certainly gave me some nice timely reminders and I hope you feel the same. I hope you feel better equipped as a coach, a parent, player or psychologist. I certainly do. 
for spending the time in the company of Edu. And if you've enjoyed this episode, I'd love it. That's right. As Kevin Keegan says, I'd love it if you could leave a positive review for the podcast on Apple, on iTunes. I'd be very grateful as it helps us increase the reach of the podcast, which means the positive messages that do go out reach more people, which ultimately mean more people are affected positively, which is what it's all about. So go on, please rate and review the podcast on Apple, on iTunes, and have a fantastic week ahead. If you enjoyed this episode of the Demystifying Mental Toughness podcast with David Charlton, do check out my website, sport-excellence.co.uk and my online sports psychology resources. The Sport-Excellence website has essential resources for anyone looking to build their own mental toughness or the mental toughness of their athletes or teams, or if you want to achieve peak performance more often or optimal functioning. The Sport Excellence website has everything you need to keep moving forward and thrive. So go on, head over to sport-excellence.co.uk to find out more.